Okay, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter, and I'm back with you now after a brief break. And uh, we're rounding second and heading for home with this program. Uh, there's two main sections left in this program before we uh, call it a wrap. And that is, uh, we're going to get into now section three of the exam, uh, which involves uh, the neurologic examination of the upper extremity. Up to this point in time, uh, we have touched upon some of the neurologic exam, and we're going to put the finishing touches on the uh, upper extremity neurologic exam. <coughs> and then in the last section of the program, we're going to go into the permanent impairment calculations for uh, upper extremity impairments due to entrapment neuropathies. So to begin this section, I uh, want to focus our attention on the neurologic component of the upper extremity exam. And, and when we talk about the upper extremity exam, there may be many procedures that you do in the course of your uh, normal examination procedures. Uh, you palpate, you measure range of motion of the joints, and you do various orthopedic tests and, and all that stuff. Well, for the purposes of this program, we want to focus on the, the neurologic components of the upper extremity exam. And specifically speaking, the upper extremity exam, uh, the upper extremity neurologic exam consists of uh, sensory examination procedures, consists of motor examination procedures, consists of a reflex examination, and also consists of measurements of girth. And girth measurements are taken 10 centimeters above and 10 centimeters below the elbow joint. Um, with regard to the sensory exam, that's going to consist of procedures to test the sensory modalities of light touch, pain, and two-point discrimination. The motor exam is going to be completed with the use of manual muscle testing of the muscles innervated by the named peripheral nerves. And for the sensory exam and the motor exam, uh, we're going to focus our attention on testing uh, the autonomous or pure patch zones uh, for the sensory exam. And then for the motor exam, we're going to focus on finding uh, groups of muscles that are almost entirely or completely uh, innervated by the named peripheral nerve. And in this program, uh, we're focused on uh, the radial nerve, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve. <clears throat> and then uh, the reflex exam will consist of testing of the biceps reflex, the brachioradialis reflex, and the tricep reflex. And we'll go over and review uh, reflex arcs and the components of the reflex arcs to refresh your memory about what it is that you're actually testing all the structures that are involved in testing uh, for reflexes and what it means to have normal reflexes. You know, when you have normal uh, upper extremity or lower extremity reflexes, it indicates that a lot of tissues, a lot of structures, uh, and a lot of functions are, 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 are properly working. So review that we'll, we will review that and refresh our memories on what it exactly means to have normal and abnormal uh, reflexes. So let's get in now to uh, first a discussion of sensory examination procedures. Recall that uh, with our sensory examination, what we're doing is we're testing the ability of nerves to transmit information uh, from the periphery and bring that information through sensory afferent neurons uh, to the central nervous system. And by central nervous system, we mean bring information to the spinal cord and, and up to consciousness uh, up into the brain. Now, not all sensory information 
makes it up into the brain into consciousness, uh, but most of it does, and certainly in our examination procedures when we are uh, directly testing uh, sensation, we are asking our patients to report to us that indeed they feel the sensation, so that is an indication uh, that they know that they feel the, the stimulus, uh, that's an indication that that sensory information is reaching consciousness. So we'll talk about uh, different type of sensory impulses that uh, are restricted to uh, circulating no higher than the spinal cord and those other receptors that uh, do transmit information up to consciousness uh, up into the brain. Now recall uh, back from uh, Neuro 101, Neuroanatomy 101, that sensory stimulus is picked up in the periphery through a variety of uh, populations of different types of sensory receptors. And there's two basic classifications uh, of sensory receptors uh, that we'll be involved with. The first major category are the unencapsulated sensory receptors and the second category are the encapsulated sensory receptors. So uh, let's describe what each of these are and then we'll go through them uh, one by one. The unencapsulated uh, sensory receptors are a small group uh, pretty much just involving uh, free nerve endings that uh, do not have any type of uh, capsule associated with the uh, endings. Uh, the encapsulated receptors are a much larger group and, in, and include a variety of different types of receptors that have uh, different configurations uh, of receptor encapsulated endings. And you'll recall some of the names of these. Uh, these include the Meissner's corpuscles, uh, includes Ruffini corpuscles, involves Pacinian corpuscles, involves Krauss's end bulbs, and, and these are all sensory receptors that have <coughs> multi-layer and uh, lamellated structures uh, basically that convey uh, deformity. When the, when the receptor ending, the encapsulated receptor is deformed, uh, through either motion or mechanical stimuli, that causes a depolarization or a stimulus to be transmitted along that nerve that tells your brain, hey, that there's been a movement or that I've been touched or that I've been stimulated. Uh, also included in the encapsulated receptors are the uh, Golgi tendon organs found in muscle and, I'm sorry, Golgi tendon organs found in uh, tendons and muscle spindles uh, that are found uh, embedded within intrafusal uh, muscle fibers in the belly of skeletal muscles. So anatomically speaking, uh, for those of you that have uh, the handout materials, um, I have a diagram here of both unencapsulated and encapsulated uh, sensory receptors. Uh, free nerve endings, as you can see, uh, terminate uh, in the uh, skin and subcutaneous tissues and uh, on the appropriate stimulus, whether it be cold or hot or pain, uh, those generate a uh, an action potential which is conducted up the length of the axon. Uh, the nerve cell bodies of, of these are located in the dorsal root ganglion and the impulse is then transmitted from the dorsal root ganglion uh, up into the central ne uh, nervous system into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Um, <coughs> an encapsulated nerve ending um, is really basically uh, just a multi-layered uh, epithelial structure uh, that houses uh, the axon terminal 
And similar to the free nerve ending, uh, on deformity of the uh, encapsulated receptor uh, will trigger an action potential to be transmitted up the axon uh, to the nerve cell body in the dorsal root ganglion and then from there into the uh, spinal cord through the dorsal horn. And then from there we'll, we'll make any one of a variety of different synapses with uh, second order neurons or interneurons um, and create some sort of uh, a response, either a conscious sensation of uh, pain, pressure, touch, or perhaps even contribute to an unconscious action such as uh, reflex, uh, reflex uh, in the exam maneuver or reflex control uh, of posture, for example. Now, now these uh, sensory receptors that we're, we'll be dealing with um, are all what are known as unipolar neurons. Unipolar neurons. And when you think of the receptors of these unipolar neurons, most of these receptors are located in the skin layer and they include the unencapsulated and the encapsulated endings. And if we think about the typical physiology of a, a neuron, we say that dendrites uh, pick up impulses or generate impulses and bring impulses to the nerve cell body. And then axons send impulses from the nerve cell body out away from the nerve cell body. Well, that's a good functional description of what unipolar neurons do. However, we don't call the um, the uh, incoming messages to the nerve cell body, we don't call those dendrites. We call those uh, s uh, peripheral processes, meaning that they pick up uh, sensory information in the periphery and bring that information to the uh, cell body. Recall the cell body is located in the dorsal root ganglion and all those cell bodies are derived embryologically uh, from the neural crest cells. And then from the cell body in the dorsal root ganglion uh, uh, signals, meaning action potentials, are uh, propagated away from the cell body towards the central nervous system through what are called the central processes. So we have peripheral processes going out to the periphery and sending receptors to the skin, the hair, the subcutaneous tissues, to the muscles, to the tendons, uh, also joint mechanoreceptors, and they send impulses towards the cell body through peripheral processes and then those impulses are propagated from the cell bodies uh, through central processes that then bring information uh, to the central nervous system. The free nerve endings, the unencapsulated receptors, those are found uh, in the epithelial layer of the skin and the mucosa. Um, those convey sensory information including pain, including crude touch, including temperature, including the sensations of itch and the sensations of tickle. Uh, the encapsulated uh, receptors known as Meissner's corpuscles, those are found in the skin, particularly in and around the papillae of the dermis. And those are found in greatest populations in the fingertips and lips, those areas of the motor of the sensory humunc homunculus uh, that have the greatest representation in the brain. Those are responsible for uh, conducting information uh, related to fine touch and low frequency vibration. Um, the Ruffini corpuscles, those are also located in the dermis uh, and in the subcutaneous tissue of the fingertips. Those are responsible for conveying information related to touch and pressure. Uh, the Pacini corpuscles, 
Those are also encapsulated uh, corpuscles, <coughs> encapsulated uh, receptors. Those are found in the subcutaneous tissues, especially around joints. And those convey information regarding pressure and high frequency vibration. The Krauss's end bulbs, those are found uh, in the dermal layer of the skin. They're found in the subcutaneous tissue, found in the mucosa of the lips, they're found in the eyelids, found in the external genitalias, and those are responsible for giving information regarding touch and pressure. Um, the proprioceptive organs uh, of the Golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles. Uh, the Golgi tendon organs are found in the musculotendinous junction and they are responsible for conveying information regarding uh, proprioception and in this case uh, they apprise uh, your central nervous system of a sense of tension uh, in the muscles. And the muscle spindles, these are found uh, within uh, the belly of skeletal muscles. They convey a sense of muscle length and also a rate of change of muscle length. And the Golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles uh, are interesting receptors in that, in that information that is conveyed to the central nervous system from these organs uh, does not reach consciousness. In other words, you you don't you don't receive conscious uh, perception of the sense of tension in your muscles and the rate of length of change of your muscles as you go about your activities of daily living. This is all information that is handled uh, locally in the spinal cord through reflex motor activity and or conveyed up to unconscious portions of the brain uh, that are involved with posture and motor control areas such as uh, for example the cerebellum. The other sensory information from free nerve endings uh, Krauss's end balls, Meissner's corpuscles, all of that information uh, is conveyed to the conscious portion of the uh, nervous system through ascending uh, sensory tracts uh, in the anterolateral spinal thalamic tracts. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, here as we go. Those of you that have a copy of the handout materials, I have uh, an image that shows uh, a depiction of a section of the integumentary system and shows a piece of epidermis, uh, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer below the dermis. and. Uh, interposed amongst all this, uh, all these structures uh, are many of these various encapsulated and unencapsulated uh, sensory receptors. We see uh, at the epidermal dermal junction uh, we have free nerve endings and I'll just point these out for those of you that are on the uh, watching the PowerPoint. We have the free nerve endings here located right in the dermal papillae. We have here uh, a sensory nerve with some type of a encapsulated uh, receptor here, probably a Meissner's corpuscle, which is uh, indicated here. Yes, that's a Meissner's corpuscle. Um, we have sensory nerve endings that surround hair follicles. I don't believe any, yeah, any of those are shown here. Um, but we see the Meissner's corpuscles. We see the uh, Pacinian lamellated corpuscles down at the subcutaneous layer. Uh, and it's interesting, these are located in the subcutaneous layer, so in order for this uh, sensory nerve ending to discharge or create an impulse, which we call an action potential, uh, 
the stimulus would have to penetrate through the epidermis and the dermis significant enough to cause a def deformation of this receptor. Uh, only, only, only then will it depolarize and, and generate an action potential. So these are responsible for detecting uh, touch and pressure sensation that makes its way into the deeper layers. Um, and I think that's about all the uh, receptors that we have here. This uh, shows a, a nerve ending that wraps around the base of a, of a hair follicle such that when the hair follicle is deformed, for example, if a spider was walking on your arm and it would deform this hair follicle, then we would get a, uh, an action potential generated in this uh, sensory nerve ending and that would be uh, propagated toward the central nervous system up into consciousness and you would say to yourself, wow, I feel like something's on my on my skin and, and you might itch yourself, for example. Shown here in this diagram and for those of you that have your handout materials are both um, uh, examples of muscle spindles and examples of Golgi tendon organs and a lot of the details are left out here but very simply and for our purposes uh, the Golgi tendon organs uh, are responsible for conveying information uh, to your central nervous system on an unconscious level to uh, prevent the excessive development of tension uh, in the muscle and tendon unit, thereby protecting the muscle from uh, uh, damage. Uh, the muscle spindles are, are located within, deep within the uh, fibers of the belly of skeletal muscles and these muscle spindles are constantly sending uh, information to the central nervous system uh, about uh, uh, changes in length of your muscle and also about the rate at which the muscle length changes are taking place and this is impo important for uh, coordinating movements and coordinating posture and coordinating uh, activities between various muscle groups as you go throughout uh, normal activities. So all these structures uh, we're going to have uh, different uh, examination maneuvers for and uh, we're going to test various, uh, various receptors in our uh, sensory exam and depending upon the findings of your sensory exam uh, will determine how deep uh, you get into uh, testing uh, these various receptors. For the basic examination maneuvers, uh, we're going to limit our examination to just a small population uh, of these receptors and specifically uh, we're going to limit our examination to testing for the modalities of light touch, for the modalities of pain, and for the modalities of uh, two-point discrimination. So when we're dealing with the upper extremity exam, we're going to test uh, each nerve for three different modalities. And depending upon our findings, we can add additional modalities if we need additional information. But to begin, a thorough exam would include testing the modalities of light touch, the modalities of pain, and the modalities of two-point discrimination. Now, for testing light touch, we use the SEMS-Weinstein monofilaments and these are specifically described in the AMA guides. So if you don't already have SEMS-Weinstein monofilaments, you need to purchase those because they are specifically described in the AMA guides and when you describe the findings of your sensory exam, you want to you wanna incorporate the, the words SEMS-Weinstein monofilaments in your description so that the parties know that you followed the exact procedures as described in the AMA guides. Uh, for the pain examination, we're going to use the Wartenberg pinwheel 
and we're going to use the sharp prongs on the Wartenberg pinwheel. And then for two-point discrimination, uh, I like to use the esthesiometer instrument. Uh, esthesiometer instrument uh, is very convenient to use. Uh, it has a sliding uh, distance scale so you can quickly and accurately um, determine uh, your two-point discrimination distance and it's comfortable, it's small, it fits in the hand and it can also be used uh, for some other examination maneuvers related to carpal tunnel syndrome which we will uh, get to here shortly. Now for two-point discrimination, uh, normal two-point discrimination uh, and this is according to the AMA guides is two to four millimeters on the fingertips four to six millimeters on the dorsum of the fingers eight to twelve millimeters on the palm and twenty to thirty millimeters on the dorsum of the hand so what that tells us is is that the sensory receptors are the densest and the most closely packed uh, on the fingertips and they're the least dense and uh, the more are more distantly packed on the dorsum of the hand so we know that the fingertips uh, are served by both the median and ulnar nerves. Uh, the dorsum of the fingers are served by uh, the radial and median nerves. And the dorsum of the hand uh, largely supplied by the radial nerves. So the radial sensory receptors that are transmitted in the radial nerve um, are much less densely packed and thereby, therefore by analogy uh, there are me much fewer uh, sensory receptors packaged in the radial nerve than there are in either the median or the ulnar nerve. So let's go through the examination, the sensory examination uh, of the radial nerves, radial nerve, ulnar nerve and median nerve. Uh, for the radial nerve, you will test light touch using a Semmes-Weinstein monofilament at the dorsal web space between the thumb and index finger. And we said earlier uh, when we talked about the radial nerve that this area between the dorsal web space, uh, dorsal first web space between the thumb and the index finger is purely innervated by sensory receptors that are traveling in the radial nerve. This is called a pure patch uh, for the radial nerve. So you would just touch there uh, with your Semmes-Weinstein monofilament and as your examinee indicates to you that they uh, feel the stimulus, you would conclude that uh, radial nerve function, radial nerve sensory function uh, is preserved. Then you would uh, do the same thing with your pinwheel uh, testing at the dorsal first web space. Ask the injured worker uh, where they feel this and if they feel this. And if they're able to accurately localize the stimulus, that tells you that the radial nerve uh, function is preserved there. Uh, and what you're, what you're, what you're uh, discovering is that free nerve endings unencapsulated free nerve endings are firing when the sharp edges of the pinwheel roll across the surface of the skin and stimulate those free nerve endings. The, the sharp uh, spikes on the pinwheel stimulate the free nerve endings and apprise your brain about uh, pain. This is a form of a modified pain sensation. And then you would also test two-point discrimination uh, at the dorsal web space between the thumb and the index finger. And according to the AMA guides, uh, your normal two-point discrimination uh, would be somewhere between 20 and 30 millimeters. Now that's a large range. That's a large range. So if you're getting a finding uh, of 30 millimeters, it may or may not be a normal finding. How would you know if it's a normal finding? 
Well, probably the best way would be to test bilaterally. Make sure that that's the same finding uh, on the uninvolved upper extremity. If it is, uh, then that's an indication that that would be uh, a normal finding. <coughs> For the ulnar nerve, uh, you're going to test at the distal ulnar aspect of the little finger. So take a look down at your hand in anatomic position. Go to the distal phalanx of the pinky finger and out on the ulnar aspect is a pure patch uh, of skin served s exclusively uh, by sensory receptors that project their peripheral processes towards the central nervous system in, and, and are carried in the ulnar nerve. They're wrapped in what we call the ulnar nerve. So you stimulate this area with uh, your Sems Weinstein monofilament. You run your pinwheel across this area and if the injured worker is able to uh, quickly and accurately localize the stimulus then that's a, a physical exam finding for preserved sensory function uh, of the ulnar nerve. Similarly in the same area you would do uh, two-point discrimination testing uh, again at the distal ulnar aspect of the little finger. Now that we're on the fingertips, uh, our findings should be somewhere between 2 and 4 millimeters. 2 to 4 millimeters, always testing bilaterally. Uh, for the median nerve, the autonomous zone or the pure patch of median ner nerve innervation is at the distal radial aspect of the index finger. Uh, so looking down at your hand in anatomic position, go to the distal phalanx of the index finger and on its radial aspect uh, this is served by sensory fibers that travel exclusively in the median nerve and project their peripheral processes towards the central nervous system all wrapped in what we call the peripheral median nerve. And by the way you do this uh, uh, Sems Weinstein monofilament testing for light touch and pinwheel testing for pain uh, with the examinee's eyes closed. And what you do is you tell them to close their eyes and that you're going to touch various parts of their arms and hands and with their eyes closed you want them to tell you where they feel it and as you uh, touch with your monofilament on the distal radial aspect of the index finger they will tell you yes I feel that it's on my finger they won't say it's the distal radial aspect but they'll say it's on my finger and you may even sing, see the uh, distal phalanx move as they indicate where they feel it so that's a sign of preserved function uh, two-point discrimination testing at the same area uh, should also be uh, approximately two to four millimeters making sure that you always uh, compare bilaterally. So uh, actually that's very simple. Those were three small pure patches uh, of areas that we can quickly and accurately test uh, to give us immediate uh, information as to the function of the, uh, the nerves that we're concerned with. In this case it's the radial ulnar and median nerves. So that's the sensory exam. That can be done uh, in about less than uh, one minute, uh, even including the two-point discrimination. Now, uh, two-point discrimination testing is not required unless we're talking about carpal tunnel syndrome, but you can do two-point discrimination testing in cases uh, where light touch does not seem to be uh, 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 accurate, where light touch testing uh, does not produce uh, an immediate response from your examinee. 
Uh, in cases where pinwheel testing is equivocal or sluggish, then you may go to two-point discrimination testing. I generally don't do two-point discrimination testing except for cases uh, involving carpal tunnel syndrome because it's required by the guides, uh, and we'll get to that shortly. Generally, I just do the light touch using the SEMS Weinstein monofilament. So considering that we're just testing three autonomous or pure patches, um, bilaterally, this can be done literally uh, in less than a minute, even including testing for uh, the musculocutaneous and axillary nerves. So that is the sensory portion of the exam. What about the motor portion of the exam? The motor portion of the exam consists of uh, manual muscle testing, testing of reflexes, which is, by the way, uh, a combined test that gives us information about both sensory and motor function, but we include it here in the motor portion of the exam. And then also uh, measurements for girth, uh, and girth measurements are taken uh, 10 centimeters above and 10 centimeters uh, below uh, the elbow. So let's talk a little bit about manual muscle testing. Now, the AMA guides uh, describe manual muscle testing. Uh, and manual muscle testing is specifically described in chapter, six, uh, chapter 15, the spine chapter. It's mentioned in chapter 16, the upper extremity chapter. Um, it's mentioned in chapter 17, the lower extremity chapter, uh, but nowhere in the guides, nowhere in the guides is there any specific mention uh, of the technique for manual muscle testing. And so I go through uh, some technique uh, discussions here in this program. And uh, I've uh, referenced several textbooks and uh, references for the description of manual muscle testing that I'm about to give you here. And I provide those references for you uh, in your handout materials. Now, let's talk about some of the uh, motor pathways that provide for voluntary control of skeletal muscles, the first of which uh, is the lateral cortical spinal pathway. Uh, and this plus the anterior cortical spinal pathway are going to give us uh, the majority of our motor, voluntary motor control uh, that we're concerned with in testing the upper extremities. So with both of these pathways, the testing begins with your examinee having a conscious uh, will to produce muscle tension. And the conscious will to produce muscle tension begins with a uh, discussion from you, the, uh, the examiner, explaining fully to your examinee what it is you're trying to do and what it is that you want them to do. And then secondarily, by engaging their competitive spirit uh, and getting them to participate fully in, in their exam, this engages the conscious uh, signaling of the muscles. And this conscious signaling, uh, signaling happens through the upper motor neurons, which are projected downward into the spinal cord. In this case, we're dealing with the spinal cord at the level of C5 to T1. It's projected down into the spinal cord into either the anterior or lateral uh, cortical spinal pathway. From, <coughs> from its synapse in the spinal cord uh, in the ventral horn, uh, these first order neurons synapse with lower motor neurons, which then continue the willful impulses from consciousness out to the skeletal muscles in the trunk uh, and to parts of the limbs. The anterior cortical spinal pathway would project 
uh, to skeletal muscles in the proximal parts of the limbs and the lateral cortical spinal pathway will project to skeletal muscles in the more distal parts of the limbs. Um, for testing cranial nerves, uh, same uh, general uh, outline applies. However, that's beyond the scope of uh, this particular program. And we do go into that uh, testing the cranial nerves in another program, which is entitled The Importance of the Neurologic Examination. So I encourage you to uh, also get and study that program as well. So let's go over some procedures for manual muscle testing. And as I said, uh, the exact procedure for doing manual muscle testing uh, is not described in the AMA guides. The AMA guides do talk about doing manual muscle testing, but there's no procedure given in the AMA guides for how to do it, uh, etc. So I share with you here uh, some general principles uh, for manual muscle testing. Number one, you want to select movements for the examinee to resist that would just about match your own uh, arm and ham strength. Uh, so select movements that are neither too strong for you to possibly overcome nor too weak for you to judge their resistance. Okay. So for example, if you are testing uh, resisted shoulder abduction in a small female and you're a large male examiner, uh, <clears throat> you want to not uh, apply your resistance to their uh, wrist or hand area. You would shorten the lever up and give your examinee a little bit more mechanical uh, leverage and mechanical advantage by placing your resistance uh, at the elbow rather than at the outstanded, uh, extended uh, arm at the wrist and hand because that's just simply too long a lever and your examinee uh, would be too weak uh, in that position and you would not be able to uh, accurately judge uh, their resistance. So select movements that are neither too strong for you to possibly overcome nor too weak for you to judge their resistance. So in contrast to, to that example, if you were to be testing a, a muscle builder guy, a 250 pound muscle builder guy with deltoids the size of uh, bowling balls, when you test resisted shoulder abduction on him, you, you do want to make sure that you extend his arm out fully and you apply your pressure uh, to his wrist or top of his hand. In this case you increase the length of the lever to give yourself mechanical advantage. Uh, principle number two is to understand that muscles are strongest when acting from their shortest length and have little or no strength when acting from their longest position. Therefore to test muscles of weak or modest strength Start with the muscle in a position of strength. To test very strong muscles, place the muscle in a position of disadvantage to bring them within your own range of strength. And I just gave a couple examples of how to do that. Uh, principle number three, engage the examinee and get their competitive spirit into the game. Encourage them to put forth their best effort. And um, in, in, this, uh, in this vein, uh, you may want to perform several repetitions uh, to get them engaged. And also several repetitions uh, serves to get them familiarized with the test maneuver and get them uh, accustomed to applying resistance through uh, the particular muscle group that they're involved and I'll usually have them do two to three to four efforts and I judge the third and fourth uh, effort uh, as representative of their best effort. I don't, I don't use the first or second efforts uh, 
uh, first or second attempts as evidence uh, of their best efforts until I'm certain that they know what they're doing and that they're fully warmed up and ready to uh, put forward a maximal contraction. Uh, principle number four, test in a repeatable superior to inferior direction. Number five, always stabilize the proximal joint to prevent muscle substitution. Stabilize the proximal joint. So for example, when testing resisted shoulder abduction, you would stabilize the scapula. Uh, for testing resisted elbow flexion, you would stabilize the humerus. For testing resisted wrist extension of the radial nerve, you would stabilize the forearm, etc. Always stabilize the proximal joint to prevent muscle substitution. Um, and so in this program, uh, we're going to talk about specific manual muscle tests for the upper extremities. Um, in other programs, I describe specific manual muscle tests for the spine uh, and for the lower extremity examinations as well. In this program, of course, we're focused um, on the upper extremities. So uh, let's talk about the motor exam, the manual muscle testing exam uh, of the radial ulnar and median nerves. Um, for the radial nerve, we're going to test resisted wrist extension. This uses the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Those are radial nerve innervated muscles. You stabilize the forearm and, uh, and test resisted wrist extension. And if the wrist extension is strong and symmetric bilaterally with no evidence of weakness or give way. This is an uh, indication of preserved motor function uh, of the radial nerve. And that's generally all you need to do. If you want to, if you have time, uh, you can test resisted finger extension. And remember that the radial nerve controls extension of all the fingers including the thumb. So you can do resisted thumb extension. You can do resisted second and third uh, fingers, second, third, and fourth, sec second, third, and fourth, uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth fingers, etc. Uh, this is testing the extensor digitorum communis, the extensor indicis proprius and the extensor digiti minimi, all of which are controlled by the radial nerve. And if those, uh, those muscle actions, finger extension that is, are strong and symmetric bilaterally with no evidence of weakness or give way, that's an indication of preserved function of, of the uh, motor fibers of the radial nerve. Now, just a note, uh, when you're testing resisted wrist extension, that, of course, is going to be a much stronger muscle action than is resisted finger extension. Uh, and so make sure to match your resistance according to the strength uh, of the muscles that you're testing. Uh, with regards to the ulnar nerve, very simple, very simple. You would test uh, resisted abduction, abduction of the little finger. So look down at your own hand and uh, abduct your little finger. This uses uh, both the dorsal interossei and also the abductor digiti minimi muscles, both of which are uh, exclusively innervated by the ulnar nerve. And make sure to uh, match your strength uh, with the strength of these muscles, uh, which are easily overpowered, by the way. So you want to use your own, your own uh, pinky finger in resisting their pinky finger. And that way you, you compare uh, apples to apples of similar muscles. And that gives you a good indication as to uh, the strength of those ulnar innervated muscles. So if the abductor digiti minimi 
uh, is strong and symmetric bilaterally, that's an, a good indication of preserved uh, motor function of the ulnar nerve. For the median nerve, uh, you can do any one of a number of tests. Uh, usually when I'm just dealing with uh, uh, the median nerve exam in general, I'll just do one of these tests. Uh, in cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, we'll add uh, possibly a third or a second or even a third test, and I'll explain those as we go. Um, so uh, you would test resisted thumb opposition. Resisted thumb opposition. So to test resisted thumb opposition, you would ask your examinee to bring their thumb, the tip of their thumb, to the tip of their pinky finger. You then grab the pinky finger and you grab the thumb and you attempt to pull them apart by directing your force to the thumb. Do not attempt to pull the pinky finger away. If you do that, you're testing pinky finger opposition, which is an ulnar innervated muscle, when in actuality we're trying to test thumb opposition to determine the function of the median nerve. So uh, thumb opposition, resisted thumb opposition, tests the opponent's pollicis. Uh, opponent's pollicis uh, brevis muscle. And if the opponent's pollicis is uh, strong and symmetric bilaterally, uh, that would be an indication of preserved uh, motor function of the peripheral median nerve. Uh, if you want to, or in the case of carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, test um, um, resisted thumb uh, flexion using the flexor pollicis brevis, uh, which is flexes the proximal phalanx of the thumb, that would be another test that you could use. But in the presence of normal thumb opposition, your exam is pretty much done, except for uh, in cases of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and um, in this program, for those of you that have the handouts, uh, I also discuss, for those of you that have the handouts, I also discuss the functions, uh, the motor functions of the axillary nerve at the shoulder and the musculocutaneous nerve at the elbow. And you can read about those uh, through independent study. Let's uh, talk about uh, reflex arcs at this point. <clears throat> um, with the upper extremity reflexes, we're concerned with the biceps, the brachioradialis, and the tricep reflexes. And we've all done these reflexes. We've done them a thousand times. And of course, when we do these reflex examinations, we do them kind of on autopilot, kind of on remote control, kind of robotically. And really, all we're looking for is a good uh, brisk jump to indicate that the reflex is normal. But I want to go through uh, the components of a reflex arc to refresh our memories as to what it is that we're actually testing when we do uh, a, a reflex tap. What, what is it that we're actually testing? Because the reason I go through this uh, is to show you that in the presence of normal reflexes, which is generally what we find in most cases, uh, unless there is bona fide uh, damage uh, to the nerve, uh, generally, we find normal reflexes. Now, we don't always find normal reflexes, but in the case of normal reflexes, which is a common finding, I should say it that way, uh, what does that mean? 
th that's the reason I'm going through the components of a reflex arc, is to show you that uh, reflexes are one of the few objective tests that we actually have. See, most of the tests that we do are, are, are largely subjective. And in fact, the, the sensory exam that I just went through is, is almost completely subjective. And the motor exam is, is largely subjective, meaning that it's under the, um, uh, under the cooperation uh, of your examinee. But reflexes, on the other hand, are one of the very few truly objective tests that we have in our dis at our disposal. And so, on an objective basis, uh, when you have normal reflexes, uh, that says a lot. And I'll explain exactly what it does say uh, after we review the components of a reflex arc. So let's say, for example, we're uh, going to test the biceps reflex. OK, we know that that's uh, a reflex mediated by uh, the C5 nerve. So uh, let's consider the biceps reflex. The first component of the reflex arc uh, includes the stimulus. And in this case, the stimulus is a rapid stretch of a muscle and tendon, muscle and or tendon. They're called muscle stretch reflexes or muscle tendon reflexes. So it's the stimulus that causes a rapid stretch of muscle and or tendon. And, and we produce that stimulus uh, with our uh, hammer, with our reflex hammer. Well, the rapid stretch of the muscle and tendon is detected or picked up by specialized receptors. We talked about these receptors. In this case, these receptors are called muscle spindles. And these muscle spindles are located deep within uh, intrafusal fibers in the belly of, in this case, the bicep muscle. And this is a specialized receptor that is going to depolarize when it's subjected to a rapid stretch by the reflex hammer. So here comes the reflex hammer, which is the stimulus. It causes a rapid stretch of a muscle or tendon. That rapid stretch of the muscle or tendon is picked up by this specialized receptor that then depolarizes. When that specialized receptor depolarizes, that action potential travels up the peripheral process of this unipolar neuron. And it travels upward. In this case, it travels upward in the musculocutaneous nerve. In other words, this sensory neuron, this unipolar neuron, this has its ending in the interfusal fibers of the bicep muscle. This sensory neuron travels in the musculocutaneous nerve. And it travels towards the spinal cord with its nerve cell body located in the dorsal root ganglia at the segmental level of C5. And from the dorsal root ganglion, this action potential, this sensory impulse, is conveyed through the central process of this unipolar uh, neuron to the spinal cord, where it enters, enters the spinal cord through the dorsal horn. And then once it's in the spinal cord, it then makes one or two uh, connections through interneurons and eventually synapses on the motor neuron in the ventral horn that has its cell body in the ventral horn. And when the impulse is carried across the synapse, from the sensory interneuron to the motor neuron cell, 
that action potential then gets conducted or propagated down the axon of the motor neuron which exits the spinal cord in the ventral root which then joins with the dorsal root to form the spinal nerve continues down through the brachial plexus passing from the trunks to the divisions to the cords finally making its way into the terminal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve where that axon continues down and makes a synapse on the effector which in this case is the bicep muscle it makes a synapse at the neuromuscular junction it releases a discharge and chemicals across the neuromuscular junction that creates an effect in the effector and remember the only effectors uh, of the peripheral nervous system uh, are skeletal muscles uh, smooth muscles or glands and in the case of the somatic nervous system we're dealing with skeletal muscles so in this case we're talking about the bicep muscle and it's the bicep muscle that then carries out the response in this case the response is a quick jerk which causes a reflexive shortening of the muscles so we started out with a stimulus which was a rapid stretch and then the ultimate response is to have a reflexive shortening uh, of the respective muscle. In this case, we're talking about the biceps muscle. So for those of you that have the handout materials, I have a, a diagram uh, that shows the reflex arc. The stimulus uh, comes down. Uh, created by the reflex hammer which causes a stretch of the patellar uh, tendon or patellar ligament whichever you prefer that creates a rapid stretch uh, in the quadricep muscle that's picked up by a stretch receptor uh, which conveys an impulse all the way up the sensory neuron and into the spinal cord uh, in this case it's at the level of C5 and then through a series of interneuron synapses within the spinal cord uh, that motor impulse to shorten the muscle uh, is conveyed out the motor neuron uh, where it ultimately synapses on the quadricep muscle in what's known as a motor unit and causes release of acetylcholine <coughs> which diffuses across the neuromuscular junction and creates a quick contraction of the uh, biceps muscle. I'm sorry, did I say quadriceps earlier? Uh, our image <laughs> is of the quadriceps, but our example is of the biceps. <coughs> and it causes a reflexive shortening uh, of the bicep muscle. So we have reflexes in the upper extremity uh, that we test. We test the biceps, we test the brachioradialis, and we also test the triceps muscle. The biceps reflex is largely a C5 uh, uh, test. It's a test for also for the musculocutaneous nerve because those sensory receptors uh, travel in the musculocutaneous nerve. The uh, brachioradialis or extensor digitorum reflex is largely uh, a test for the C6 uh, level of the spinal cord. It's also a test for the radial nerve because those sensory endings uh, send their per, uh, peripheral processes to the spinal cord in the radial nerve. Uh, and then the triceps reflex uh, is generally considered to be a C7 mediated reflex also uh, conveyed by the radial nerve. So let's assume that your biceps, extensor digitorum, and triceps reflexes are all preserved and all intact. What does that actually indicate? 
Well, it indicates a lot. And let me just give you an example of what it indicates. It indicates that the left and right bicep muscle spindles, the stretch receptors, are functioning normally. That's in the case of normal C5 reflexes. In the case of normal C6 reflexes, it indicates that the left and right extensor digitorum muscle spindles are functioning. In the case of normal triceps reflexes, it indicates that the left and right triceps muscle spindles are functioning properly. And let's continue. It indicates that the left and right C5 sensory nerve root functions are normal. It indicates that the left and right musculocutaneous nerve sensory function is normal. And recall that the musculocutaneous nerve is composed of fibers of C5, C6, and C7. It indicates that the left and right C6 sensory nerve function is preserved. It indicates that the left and right radial nerve sensory function is preserved. And recall that the radial nerve is composed of fibers from C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. It indicates that the C5 level of the spinal cord is functioning normally. It indicates that the C6 level of the spinal cord is functioning normally. It indicates that the C7 level of the spinal cord is functioning normally. For if the spinal cord was not functioning normally, those sensory impulses coming up through the sensory fibers would not be able to synapse through interneurons and properly convey uh, impulses to the motor portion uh, to create a, a muscle jerk reflex. So it indicates that the spinal cord is functioning properly. On the efferent side, it indicates that the left and right C5 motor nerve roots are functioning normally. It indicates that the left and right musculocutaneous nerves are functioning normally. And that's the C5, C6, and C7 portions that contribute to the musculocutaneous nerve. It indicates that the left and right C6 motor nerve is functioning properly. It indicates that the left and right C7 motor nerve root function is proper, uh, properly functioning. It indicates that the left and right radial nerves are properly functioning and that's C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 uh, all contributing to the radial nerve. <clears throat> Finally, down at the effector level, it indicates that the left and right biceps muscles are functioning normally. It indicates that the left and right extensor digitorum muscles are functioning normally. It indicates that the left and right triceps muscles are functioning normally. So, whoo! Imagine that. A lot of things have to function normally in the presence of normal reflexes. And so that tells you a lot about this condition of your examinee. Um, and again, it's reflexes that are one of the few truly objective tests. So on an objective basis, when you have normal reflexes, it tells you that a lot of things uh, are functioning normally, even despite uh, whatever type of symptoms and activity limitations uh, your injured worker may be reporting to you, you can at least conclude that on a functional level, um, a lot of things uh, have to be functioning normally in order to have normal and brisk uh, uh, reflexes. Finally, uh, to conclude our discussion of the motor exam, uh, we talked about uh, girth measurements uh, and we take girth measurements to assess for atrophy. So recall that girth measurements are taken uh, at 10 centimeters above and 10 centimeters below uh, the elbow. And before we get into uh, a final discussion of um, uh, permanent impairments and the AMA guides. I just want to go over a couple of special tests now to conclude our uh, discussion. 
uh, of upper extremity uh, entrapment neuropathies and that involves uh, some special tests for both the ulnar nerve uh, and the median nerve. So for the ulnar nerve uh, there's a couple of special tests that you'll want to incorporate into your normal exam procedures. Uh, the first two um, involve testing uh, for ulnar nerve compression at the cubital tunnel and that includes Tunnell's sign uh, which is tapping uh, over the nerve within the cubital tunnel <clears throat> and recall that the most likely site of compression of the ulnar nerve is about a centimeter and a half distal to the medial epicondyle of the humerus so that's an area where you want to focus your uh, tapping and you can use a reflex hammer or you can even use your finger your middle finger to tap over the nerve in that area now in the case of a, a very sensitive uh, and hot ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel sometimes just even palpating over the nerve uh, will elicit uh, uh, a sensation down into the ring and finger, uh, ring and pinky fingers, and you could consider that to be a positive Tennell sign. Also, the elbow flexion uh, test involves maximum forearm flexion uh, with slight overpressure or a slight hyperflexion applied by you, the examiner. Uh, that tightens uh, the soft tissues uh, over the ulnar nerve and uh, in the case of an inflamed or an enlarged ulnar nerve uh, that will cause uh, symptoms down into the ring and pinky finger. I'm testing down at uh, the tunnel of Guyon. Again you would also um, use the um, Tunnel sign which is tapping with your reflex hammer over, or directly over the tunnel directly over the piezohamate ligament. Uh, if the nerve is hot there, you may get a positive Tunnell sign there. Also, uh, testing Fromitz sign. Fromitz sign, testing the um, ab adductor pollicis brevis by simply sticking a piece of paper uh, in between the thumb and the index finger. You can test for integrity of the adductor pollicis brevis. And then also the pure motor test for the ulnar nerve uh, is resisted adduction. No, I'm sorry, resisted abduction of the little finger uh, using the abductor digiti minimi. Um, special tests for the radial nerve are, are mostly um, limited to manual muscle testing of uh, specific muscles that are innervated by the radial nerve. Uh, for example, um, resisted elbow flexion, uh, which tests the um, brachioradialis muscle. You would test resisted elbow flexion with a semi pronated uh, forearm. Uh, you could test resisted elbow extension of uh, testing the triceps that would only be weak in the uh, presence uh, of a high ulnar, uh, I'm sorry, a high radial nerve lesion. Um, you might find some weakness of resisted elbow extension uh, due to weakness of the anconius muscle. Remember the branch, the anconius uh, comes off much lower, comes off just, just above the elbow. So if the radial nerve was damaged in the mid-shaft of the humerus, say from uh, perhaps a humerus fracture, uh, you might be able to pick up some weakness of resisted elbow extension, although, um, although I doubt it. And the reason I doubt it is because the elbow extensors, uh, meaning the tricep muscles, are so strong uh, in and of themselves that picking up uh, a small weakness due to uh, weakness of the anconius muscle is going to be difficult. Uh, you could also test uh, resisted elbow supination, which tests the supinator muscle. 
supinator is uh, is supplied by the radial nerve, especially the C5 uh, and C6 portions of the radial nerve. And then again, as we discussed extensively, you can test resisted wrist extension uh, and or resisted finger extension. And that includes any or all uh, of the fingers, including uh, the thumb. Um, special examination maneuvers for carpal tunnel syndrome. <clears throat> and this is particularly directed towards uh, QME examiners. Uh, one moment. Thank you. Just had a quick drink of water. <clears throat> um, in, the, in the QME setting, uh, we need to focus on an extended examination uh, of the median nerve uh, at the carpal tunnel. So some of the things uh, that you'll include uh, in your physical examination uh, includes um, two different types of observation. Uh, the first observation uh, involves if, uh, 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 an objective examination finding for atrophy uh, of the thenar pads and comparing the thenar pads of the involved uh, hand to the uninvolved hand. And one way to detect a subtle atrophy of the thenar pads uh, is to look at the overlying skin on the palm of the hand. Now, subtle atrophy might be uh, detectable as uh, flaccidity of the overlying skin. And when I say flaccid, I mean sometimes it's very subtle. Sometimes it's, uh, it's very subtle. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll get out my reading glasses and I'll put on my reading glasses or I'll get out a magnifying glass and I'll look at the overlying skin uh, over the thenar pads. And uh, in the presence of atrophy of the thenar pads, you'll pick up uh, increasing uh, wrinkling of the overlying skin as the muscle underneath uh, shrinks away from the overlying skin. So make sure to check the uh, thenar pads for uh, atrophy. Also, you want to observe your examinee. And you, you want to observe your examinee uh, through casual observation throughout the course of your uh, interview and examination of them. And you want to you want to make note as to whether or not they shake or wring out their hands uh, at, at any kind of periodic interval during uh, your interview and exam. As we talked about earlier, almost a universal sign of, of active carpal tunnel syndrome that's producing uh, numbness and tingling and, and even pain into the hands is, is this shaking out or wringing hands uh, type of gesture which uh, which serves to, in many cases, cause the symptoms to abate. And so you'll see uh, uh, examinees with active carpal tunnel syndrome do this free, this 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 periodic shaking out of their hands. So you want to you want to observe for that. In the absence of the shaking out hands behavior or the wringing of hands behavior, what could that tell you about the severity or the relative activity uh, of the carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, that's open to interpretation, but I'm here to tell you that in my opinion, it tells you something. It's up to you to determine uh, what that something is, and some of the remaining uh, exam maneuvers that we'll talk about may help you. Um, also, um, in the case of carpal tunnel syndrome, you want to have the injured worker or examinee uh, fill out a hand pain diagram. Hand pain diagram. And I've included a copy of a hand pain diagram uh, here with your handout materials. And you want to make sure that their description of the distribution of their symptoms uh, is in an anatomic location. In other words, it's anatomically uh, localized to the known distribution uh, of the median nerve, which we described extensively 
uh, on a prior uh, cassette or a prior hour of this program. Um, other tests that you're familiar with are uh, Phalen's tests and reverse Phalen's tests. Those uh, both cause compression uh, of the median nerve in the case of an inflamed median nerve. With a normal median nerve, it, it would be um, uncompressed and, and would be negative. In other words, the test, testing would be negative. Uh, Tunnell's test involves tapping over the uh, flexor retinaculum to see if that causes a distal pain or tingling sensation into the hand. Um, a couple of tests that you may not be as familiar with. Uh, one is Durkan's compression test. And with Durkan's compression test, uh, it's a very simple test. You simply take the thumbs of your two hands and provide uh, direct compression over the flexor retinaculum uh, in the region of the median nerve as it passes underneath the flexor retinaculum. And uh, in the case of an ischemic nerve or an inflamed nerve, uh, this can be just enough additional irritation uh, to cause a, a reproduction of the examinee's symptoms, in which case that would be considered a positive finding for sensitive and or irritated and or entrapped uh, median nerve. Another test, uh, the three jaw chuck test, um, is, a, is a fascinating test and it's a, a good test for helping to uh, determine the possibility that uh, tendinitis and or tenosynovitis uh, may be contributing to the entrapment. So with the three jaw chuck test, what you do is you have your examinee bring together the tips of all fingers. So the thumb, the index, the middle, the ring, and the pinky finger, you bring the tips of all those fingers very uh, close together, one on top of the other, and then using the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus and by pressure on the thumb also using the tendon of the flexor pollicis brevis you squeeze all those fingers together tightly thereby tightening and activating those tendons as they pass through uh, the carpal tunnel then you add additional compression by maximally flexing the wrist, sort of in producing a uh, phalanx test, meanwhile applying maximum uh, pressure to compress and press together uh, the tips of all the fingers. Now, in the case of uh, tendonitis, this compression and uh, tension on the tendons uh, may be sufficient to uh, exacerbate the nearby median nerve and reproduce uh, symptoms into uh, the hand. Symptoms including numbness, tingling, paresthesia, uh, maybe a shot of pain, in which case that would be considered uh, a positive finding, perhaps suggestive of tendonitis and or tenosynovitis um, as being the cause uh, of the carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, another couple tests uh, that you may not be familiar with, uh, the square wrist sign is described in the ACOM guidelines. And in order to make measurements for the square wrist sign, I like to use the aesthesiometer uh, instrument that I use for uh, two-point discrimination testing because it's, uh, it's ideally suited for this uh, measurement. So what the square wrist sign is, is a comparison uh, of the thickness of the wrist compared to the width of the wrist. And according to the ACOM guidelines on page 261, uh, the ratio of the thickness of the wrist divided by the width of the wrist 
should be less than 0.7. In other words, the wrist thickness should be less than the wrist width. And if you look down at your own wrist, uh, looking at the palmar aspect of your wrist, you can see the width of it is much greater than the thickness of it. But in the case of an inflamed and chronic uh, diseased carpal tunnel, the thickness of the wrist will increase. Not the width, but the thickness will increase and the ratio uh, will start to approach uh, one, meaning that the uh, wrist thickness and the width start to approach the same measurement. So that would be uh, a positive finding for uh, retained inflammation uh, within the carpal tunnel. Um, and then finally, uh, with regards to the median nerve, we have our uh, muscle tests of resisted thumb abduction. Uh, and we have our muscle tests of resisted thumb opposition. And just to recall the sensory uh, examination uh, for the median nerve into the hand involves testing uh, of light touch pain and two point discrimination uh, at the distal radial aspect uh, of the index finger. So that uh, gives you a good summary uh, of uh, some examination procedures uh, for the median, radial, and ulnar nerves. And so now uh, with that information in mind, we want to begin our discussion of permanent impairments uh, of those nerves as described uh, in the AMA guides, uh, pages 493, uh, page 480, and this is all out of chapter 16. So I'll be back with you in just a few moments, and we'll begin our final discussion uh, of this program.